What I want to go over today is in this series for understanding how to use the warrior approach to life is what I call the warrior's dilemma. Okay, so first of all, nations create a warrior class so that they can protect the nation. It's required. And part of their responsibility is to learn how to move toward the threat, toward the enemy, and use violence to neutralize them, to kill them. That's a easy, nice way of saying to kill them. Okay. So this is their job. You know, they they need to develop these fighting skills in order to protect the nation. Now, there is through history, there's been you know a lot of uh, difficulty with you might say killing your own kind, you know, killing other human beings, and so what the warrior class learned how to do is figure out ways to make that easier. Okay, so for example, they might. Uh, become berserkers, which means they, they get themselves up in a frenzy emotionally so that they uh, don't have to think so much about what they're doing. And that makes it easier to kill the enemy. Another is dehumanizing the enemy, you know, creating them into a subspecies or uh, so you don't see them as equals. So this makes it easier to, to kill others. So this is these are all kind of needed skills, you know, that warriors have a responsibility to develop to defend their nation, but it's a sword that cuts both ways. Okay, so in other words, you can be so effective as a warrior with the enemy, with these skills that you've developed, but when you come back to society, then these same skills can threaten the very society that you protect. So, in other words, they get habituated to this way of being, and then it's hard to know how to be in peacetime when you're not in a war situation. Another thing that happens is it's easy for all of us to get identified with what we do. You know, so warriors can become identified with wearing the uniform. Uh, become identified with the, the social group, the team that they're a part of, to get identified with the accolades of war, you know, the honors and the deeds and so forth. And then when they leave the service, then they don't know who they are because that identity that they've created has been left behind. They take off the uniform and so forth. So they can feel lost, you know, and then it can be even uh, easier, you might say, for them to fall into the habituated behavior to defend themselves because they feel vulnerable without that kind of an identity to understand who they are. So an example of uh, this dilemma and what was being done about it started, or one example of it is the the Takagawa shogunate that was created in about 1603, the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, Japan had been at war for a, a century. And then uh, Takagawa Iyasu, he consolidated power and then he didn't know what to do with the warrior class. All they'd known was war. So he needed to do something to redirect their attention to something else besides fighting and violence and war. So what he did is he directed them toward more peaceful activities like studying religion or calligraphy, these sorts of things. Now, one example of this, it comes from uh, Munenori. Uh, he had what's called the Life-Giving Sword School, where he learned Zen Buddhism from Takwan Soho as a Zen master. And, and he was teaching meditation and how to be at more peace and only use violence as a last resort. Uh, so he had uh, this dual capacity, the Life-Giving Sword School, which 
uh, taught the swords, uh, the people he was teaching swordsmanship, you know, how to use violence as a last resort, how to neutralize the threat rather in a more peaceful way, but also retaining the death dealing sword, which had to do with using violence when necessary. So another example uh, happened in the 20th century where uh, a fellow named Morahai Ueshiba, who ultimately developed Aikido, he was learning from these samurai also. And one thing that he thought was really uh, not very helpful was that it wasn't helpful to be fearless in battle if you're afraid in your, uh, in your regular life. So he wanted to create a martial art that created harmony during the, the fight. So there was a, a lot of helping the, the martial artist neutralize the force instead of confronting it and directly. So some great examples. Now, there's a need for both an external and an internal focus on how we're living our lives. Uh, so we, and I've covered this in other lessons, we need to find a way to uh, understand the, use the external environment, the stressors, so that we can do the internal work that we need to do to dig into our own psychology. So it's not an either or kind of thing. Uh, it's not kill or be killed. It's uh, finding a way to both um, fight for what we know is right, but then also to do it in a peaceful way. So this is a way really to move toward developing more personal power. You know, personal power is our, our ability really to keep our attention focused in the moment on what we're doing. Uh, it's, uh, it's a way of getting more self-knowledge. And that self-knowledge comes from uh, answering questions like, who am I? Like understanding yourself in a bigger context of the world. In other words, I'm not more important than others just because of these accolades of war and my identity. I see myself as equal to other human beings and that impacts how I interact with them. So for a training tip for this week, for this lesson, uh, shift toward a both and understanding. I can both um, accept my struggles, my current struggles as they are, and I can work toward a better, more peaceful future for my life. That's the lesson.